Okay. Hey, Jen. Hi. Hey, Carissa. Welcome. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll introduce the two of you and we'll, we'll kick off here. So um, yeah, this is uh, Jen Castro. She works with the organization Digital Democracy, um, working with communities in British Columbia, Ecuador, and Peru. And we've got uh, Carissa McKelvey. She's a researcher, engineer, and an advocate for ethical technology. And so they're going to speak on their experience in a collaborative community monitoring project in northern Peru. So who's going first? How do I kick this off? You're going first, Jen? OK, well, I will. Or So Jen first, and then we'll switch, or? Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll indicate to you uh, when. OK, OK. OK, just, just shout out when you need me to switch it up. So we'll do that. OK, I'm going to remove Chris. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Jen Castro. I'm joining you from Tojagwe, which is, um, you might know as Montreal, um, also along with Carissa uh, Ray McKelvey, um, who's calling in from uh, the Nakep territory, which is known as Manhattan. It's a new place name for me. So that was really great to learn. Thanks, Carissa. Um, thanks for joining us on this really brief session. Um, this is our experience of uh, doing participatory collaboration um, on open source development in the Amazon and specifically in Northern Peru. Um, sorry, technology. So uh, in a time where climate change and socioeconomic impacts, um, sorry, I'm seeing that there's a glitch on the screen um, and it might be the stream is that right, John? Um, yeah, it looks pretty glitchy to me too, but I don't. So it looks different from what you're seeing on your screen? Correct, yeah. Oh, I don't know if there's much I can do about it right now. That's, yeah, what are you, what are you playing it in? Uh, this is a browser. It's coming in. It's just slow. Slow. Uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, okay. Yeah, interesting. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I just moved to our mission here. Um, sorry about the technical glitch. This wasn't happening before. Um, so I was sharing an image of an aerial shot of the Southern uh, Amazon where gold mining is basically tearing through um, deforesting areas and a detailed image of um, women walking in what used to be lush forest um, and is now uh, open gold mines. So these kinds of impacts are really a result of, um, you know, centuries of colonization and globalization that are completely transforming how Indigenous people are relating to the world, um, prompting the need for um, communities to rise up and to confront all these shifts and changes and to seek out some um, autonomy and really work together um, with anyone who is uh, choosing to be supportive as an ally and show solidarity and uh, find ways to collaborate together because every impact that they are feeling um, is a global responsibility as it impacts our global climate. Um, so uh, I feel like I want to, if I can't do this slide performance right now, then I need to find another option. We're, we're working on a fix here. Just, uh, yeah, Chris is gonna uh, get it as a PDF and share her screen, I think. Great, thanks. Okay, so uh, one sec. Uh, I'll just keep talking because uh, I think that most of this is just words and I think that's a lot less interesting than the photos. Um, so uh, today we're going to be sharing um, some of the learnings that we've had um, as part of the digital democracy team, where we work with communities to develop um, tools, um, as Mir was describing earlier on the talk today, um, and processes that support grassroots efforts to use technology to strengthen the autonomy and agency of, of their own affected communities. I work through Digital Democracy Center's core values of uh, self-determination, autonomy, accessibility, collaboration, and uh, environmental and social justice. Uh, we're on about slide six, Carissa. Thanks. Hero. Um, and we do this through open source development, through technical accompaniment of local partners, um, and the participation in conferences like this one. Um, so our field program, uh, that's I'm on the field team, uh, we are privileged to be invited into communities to support our partners as technical collabor collaborators. Uh, my role in the program's team focuses on local partner needs. Um, next slide. 
And we work in lockstep with our small tech team who has been developing Mapeo. Um, Mir just mentioned a Mapeo desktop on a previous presentation. Um, Mapeo is an offline first, easy to use geospatial tool for community-based mapping and monitoring. Um, our tech team um, are based, uh, we're really, really quite blessed to have Carissa be part of our tech team um, for a few years and um, working most recently um, with me in person on uh, a trip to Northern Peru, which I'll be talking about. Um, but before I go into the storytelling, I'm gonna pass the mic to Carissa and she's gonna share um, a few points um, to kind of ground some of the work that uh, we've been doing together. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Yes, so um, our tech program is 100% open source and we use user-centered design and participatory design, which we're talking about today. Um, we have a lot of custom tools for offline first or local first. It's a very innovative uh, piece of software that we've spent a lot of time making sure that communities own the data. Um, and we work in very close collaboration with the programs team who have extensive experience on the ground and have built relationships with users. Um, and part of what we've, you know, what we're going to talk about today in the story is how this in, in person work is very important. And what Mir was talking about earlier, you can't just say you're participatory, you actually have to live it. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about participatory development? What is it? Um, so the first is active involvement. Um, you really want to not just say it, or you actually need to be there and have partnerships that are real partnerships with people who have been invited into these spaces. Um, and you need to address the barriers to engagement. So we can't just throw things on a mailing list or throw things on a chat room. You really need to understand where, how people show up to these spaces and how can you address barriers to certain pieces of engagement into the open source community. Um, and I think that goes along with listening first and the tech second. Um, so you really have to think, this is very important. You have to think about how to solve the problem from the eyes of the user. And that really first starts with listening to the people who are on the ground and actually understanding the problem before coming with a tech solution. I think it's easy for us as if you're a developer to come with, oh, I have an idea. I, I really like WordPress or whatever it is. So I'm going to be a WordPress developer. And, you know, we, we develop skills for that sort of technology, but we really have to listen to people before we think about the technology, even if we might be skilled in a particular technology. Um, uh, and then community centered in the decision making process, I think is very related to this. It's sort of like a progression, right? Um, decisions can't be made unilaterally. It's not really about what your intuition might be about a particular feature or what your skill set is, but what the community says they want and they need. And that goes along with the, I think, the most uh, difficult, but also most important one, which we're all here today talking about as a FOSS for good is it's not just the software, which is, you know, FOSS is great at people being able to own and take ownership of software. There's also the data. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we can make this the default for Mapeo. So communities continue using it, can continue owning the software and the data even after we're gone or if we stop maintaining it. So how does it work? I'm going to just pass over to Jen. Thanks, Carissa. Um, so yeah, just next slide. Um, it works slowly. Um, so as Carissa was talking about, um, a lot of these these processes really involve um, um, taking a pause and sitting with people, um, and quite literally using the technology together. Um, trying it together in person is such an illuminating experience. Um, this is how we can really make proper observations um, about uh, what people's gut feelings are around using tools like this. Um, the next point um, is about circling up and listening. So after um, the experience of watching and observing, also taking a pause and really taking the time to sit and listen to um, everyone who's using the tool, but also people who are not using the tool, but are impacted by the use of the tool. 
Um, often we'll have an elder or a decision maker who might not be participating in the training, but is learning about how their information is being used. And that's quite critical. Uh, the next point is actually to take all that feedback and improve it. So here's a picture of Carissa on a boat. Well, while some of us are looking at trees and rivers, uh, here, here she is um, programming on the boat. Um, and it's really quite important to, to take the feedback and immediately apply it um, as quickly as possible so that you can go through an iterative process, and which brings us to the final bit, which is repeat. Um, so um, taking that back to communities, um, seeing how they um, see the differences or notice the differences, and possibly even repeating in a different site um, to see if there's a different first hand um, experience. Um, so that takes us into some storytelling. Um, so this here is a uh, oil spill in the river basin of um, Rio Corrientes in Northern Peru, which is um, about a eight hour river boat from Iquitos, Peru, if anyone's been there. Um, and uh, in the next slide, you will see um, an image of one of the community monitors, uh, Fidel, who um, constantly has to see oil spills in his neighborhood. I think actually he took that previous photo. And um, this is the this is what is in the land where they grow their food. Um, this has been affecting children and families intergenerationally. If we move to the next slide, we'll see an image of an elder um, who's been fighting oil spills um, and advocating for the rights of children and families and the health of the community um, for over four decades. Um, she's cute and sweet here, but she is a fierce and articulate woman who works with um, her community as well as uh, three other nations who are all impacted by the oil blocks in Northern Peru that have been basically um, mismanaging all the infrastructure. So they have worked together and organized to create a community monitoring, prog monitoring program that um, has ground truthing. So if we go to the next slide, we can see um, some of the community monitors here learning to use Mapeo a desktop for um, collecting observations in order to um, try to get a better sense of how all the spills across all of their communities and across the river river basins are starting to intersect in order to hold the companies to account. Um, if we move to the next slide here, you'll see that they're using um, Mapeo Mobile. Um, and in this particular slide, what we did was um, we have started to do a train the trainers module um, kind of program where we teach some of the coordinators or leaders um, or more experienced monitors in the community to use the tool so that uh, they can later, um, if you move to the next image, um, they can later teach each other how to use the applications. Mapeo Mobile specifically um, for, for community monitoring is incredibly quick to learn to use. Um, so within uh, only a few days of using Mapeo Mobile and desktop, these coordinators can then spend one, one or two days doing a workshop with their peers. And this is quite important because um, one, they can speak and, and train in their own language. Two, um, it's very costly for us to take a long trip. It's, it's almost like a day and a half or two days of full international and regional travel to get to these communities. So doing in-person training doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is really worth the trip when it comes to um, observing user impacts and feedback. We move to the next slide. Yeah, so here you can see the monitors really supporting each other in their learning experience using the application. And while this is happening, we are observing to really find out what, what is working and what, what needs help, what needs work. Um, and in the, the next image, you'll see some um, really deep listening. Oh, sorry, this one's, um, they actually get to use the tools in the field and their training so that there's more real world conditions to, to, to keep in mind as they're using these tools that are meant for offline and remote use. And the next slide. Um, we also make sure that while we're in these kinds of spaces as technologists supporting and training, that we're also stepping back and we're learning. We're learning with the other monitors in this case about the real details around um, their context, some of the political um, maneuvering that they have to do around their information management, some of the, the basic observations that they have to make around spills, um, jurisdiction, and all these technical aspects that at the end of the day really do affect how data management happens and what kinds of decisions they need to make 
um, about their information and how they collect it. Uh, in the next image, um, we'll see, this is, well, Chris is here listening and working with um, some of the monitors who are the trainers in this case, and really kind of plugging through some of the technical issues that really only come up when you're completely offline. Um, and also to be um, clear, there's also this really amazing thing that happens when non-technologists use applications. They're really good at breaking it and finding new bugs. So these are kind of these opportunities of going in person, uh, listening and observing and, and watching how people handle and, and, and use technology um, gives an opportunity for us to question some of our assumptions about how our tools are, are reaching their goals. If we move to the next slide. We're gonna fast track this. Um, so just to give a little bit of feedback on um, another iterative process, which is when there's communities that have a little bit more access to internet, um, we're able to really um, be quite quick in our feedback. So here is a, the um, America Eddy Reserve, um, which I mentioned earlier, that has um, gold mining, elite gold mining, completely deforesting their, their area. Um, if you flash through maybe a couple of photos. Um, this is an example of one of the camps that I've seen. Um, I got to see uh, Mapeo Mobile being used to document some of these uh, illegal mining sites. And if you would advance a little bit more, um, maybe another two. Uh, you can see here that um, Mapeo is being used, again, in a training atmosphere, but also in their communities so that we can really see um, how well and effective it works and how clear our articulation of the technology is to um, users. You move forward. Um, one of the great things that we have been able to do is to collaborate quite closely with um, some of the folks in Southern Peru um, because of their access to internet is a little bit higher. Um, we can really get a lot of feedback around um, ease of use and they've been quite an amazing set of collaborators um, to help us uh, reframe some of the priorities that we have on a technical level. Um, and this is a huge impact on our tech team where, you know, we have a roadmap and then all of a sudden there's a huge block um, highlighted by our partners to indicate that, you know, this particular learning curve is too too high or too too challenging or this, this feature doesn't really work if, you know, offline maps aren't loading properly and we have to really quite do it do a turnabout around our roadmap and priorities on a technical level. If you move forward a little bit more, that's the last one there. And so here, I just wanna extend the gratitude to any of the collaborators that we have across um, Ecuador, Peru, right now, Kenya, folks in Canada, um, folks in Southeast Asia, and Mir Mir's mentioned Panama. Um, there's a lot of other um, amazing collaborators that we've been um, trying to absorb as much information as possible in order to improve Mapeo both desktop and mobile. Um, and uh, if we move forward, uh, just to highlight that uh, if you wanna learn more about um, what the experience is from the user side of using Mapeo as a community monitoring tool, um, in about an hour's time, a session's on that. And there is also a separate session from another peer around a different mapping technology, which is quite useful. Uh, next slide. Here we go to our takeaways. So um, from the collaborator's perspective, um, one of the things that was quite clear and is really hard to capture in photos is the visceral experience of being in a highly impacted area. Communities are living in really high stakes realities. Literally children die from the water poisoning. Um, the, the statistics are horrifying. It's, it's quite intense and the realities of surviving in that landscape really has to be met with a high level of sacrifice and integrity as a person who is coming in to, to offer solidarity. This is done through a lot of research, a lot of empathy, trying to find different ways to show respect um, that is culturally appropriate, and a lot of patience. You can't rush this process. And I know that that comes at great odds to developers. And so I'll have Carissa step in and share some of the developers' perspectives on this process. Yeah, um, I definitely felt that as well. It's um, it's very powerful being there. Um, I think that from a developer perspective, we often 
build for people who want and need better tools, and especially here at Phosphor Good, you know, everyone wants to build for, you know, the use cases that aren't being met by, uh, you know, market incentives. Um, but uh, I find that, you know, we, we try to fix problems that are our problems often. Um, and so really being there and doing uh, inclusive software and participatory practices, um, finding and fixing problems where where the tools are actually being used is really a powerful experience to understand um, what's going on uh, from a user perspective. Because uh, I think that, you know, technologists, you know, we're, we're trying to build the, you know, trying to imagine ourselves in the shoes often because we don't have access um, to, to really standing next to users often, um, especially if we're in a role that is very developer focused and there's lots of deadlines and that kind of thing. So I think that it's, it's great to just uh, be able to be there and it really helps the process move along and it helps uh, it be better software um, and helps us be better people too. <laughs> Um, Do you have any questions? Yeah. So this is the this is the time where we just I want to extend gratitude for um, listening at this time. And yeah, questions. Y si tienen algunas preguntas en español, they're also um, welcome. Um, and just really uh, honored to share this um, information and story with you. Oh, John, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> great story. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I love the the slides. Really, yeah, great great pictures, and it looks like there's some fascinating experiences. And um, we actually have somebody asking for a link to the presentation. So if you're able to share that, uh, either in venue list or just pass it into the chat, and I can pop it in there too. So I, we, I think we have time for a couple of quick questions. Um, so we've got one here. Do you organize trainings so this initiative can be reproduced in other regions? Um, so. Y yes, and almost. So um, the last uh, year and a bit, we've been working on a um, bigger project that is about outreach that's called the Earth Defenders Toolkit, um, where we have been trying to provide a lot more resources around some of the work that we have been doing kind of intuitively and also iteratively as, as we learn um, as technical collaborators. Um, and so the Earth Defenders Toolkit is uh, basically showing a bunch of uh, case studies, uh, a lot of links to different resources and, and guides, but also trying to um, really kind of get the minutia of the in-between because, you know, there's tool use, but then there's how to use the tool. And those can be really different things. So we are starting to expand on that. And I, um, I think we've already got some requests on our forum of the Earth Defenders Toolkit on doing um, more sessions. So if that um, community page gets um, more active and populated, we're going to start doing that. So I highly recommend um, that be something that um, people check out. Okay, here's another one for you. Uh, with mapping of, for example, illegal mining sites, are there socially sensitive prompts or training to help the data collectors to move through what might be a challenging space? Absolutely. And that is the expertise of the local organizations. So as the technologists, we try to provide the framework um, where they can define and customize um, the interface of the, of, the, of the data, basically. So we, in Mapeo specifically, we have like the open source kind of black box and that has its own defaults, but um, we also have these customizations that can be imported. And so every community can define um, what kind of data and what kind of questions get asked. And it is quite important that local decision makers um, who, and you know, with the advice of um, legal counsel and or other advocates who understand how the data gets used can customize um, the language and, and offer the training directly. We're often there side by side with them when that's happening so that we can learn from them, but they are really the true experts in, in how that gets managed. Yeah, I think the important point here is like, we're not doing this all by ourselves. We have partnerships with local orgs who uh, who are inviting us in and have that yeah. expertise. Yeah. Um, can the data be synced to OpenStreetMap? 
No, not at this point. It's actually the opposite. The idea is to, for Mapeo, is to have the data live in the community. So um, we didn't really go into the tech. We went into the like the collaboration process. But just to give a, a, a briefer from my end, so Mapeo is decentralized. And so for the community, what that means is they determine as their own autonomous agents within their community who gets to participate in that project. Um, there is no server. And the idea is that it never really reaches a server unless some other infrastructure is put in place by the community. And that is because communities are the owners of their own data. They need their own agency and um, the whole you know, generations of um, information extraction from um, original peoples across the planet has just been continuously violating um, cultural rights, human rights, and 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 legal rights, and often um, in many cases. I don't know if Chris, you want to add to that at all? No, I think you captured well. Um, I think it could be in theory, but yeah, we purposefully don't have that feature. Um, yeah. I feel like we could kick off a whole other talk about data sovereignty right now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think, and I think, I think there's there's a few talks that have existed like that in the past, but I think it's time for a, an update soon. Um, maybe next Fosbor G, we can talk about that too. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Well, th there are more there are more questions in here, but I think we're out of time, so I'm gonna let you go. And um, maybe if you if you hop into any list, you could potentially add, answer them in the chat. But anyway, thank you very much for uh, your talk. It was really fascinating, and I appreciate your. Uh, contribution. Thank you, John. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're going to take a few minutes break here before the next talk uh, coming up shortly.